In the, in the times of history, God has given men and women gifts to be able to help the poor. Uh, Christians have not only served behind pulpits, but in government, education. In fact, the tragedy is, is that what I think ruined us in the Jesus movement is we thought everybody was supposed to be one of the fivefold gifts when only a small minority belong behind the pulpit. 90% of the influence of the church should be in business, education, the arts. God needed to give a, a, a sanctified view of the world for us to invade all of the aspects of culture. We didn't do it. That's how we lost a generation. And uh, the other one was that we thought Jesus was coming any minute. Now, Nothing wrong with that because he could come any minute. And then I would definitely stop preaching. <laughs> but what I would tell you is that we had no plan. For years we quoted the verse, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Uh, if you want to understand socialism, that's when the wealth of the righteous is laid up for the wicked. But... To understand the hour we're in, we, we believe Jesus could come in any minute. Schooling, education, degrees, inventions, ideas, long-term planning was not a part of it. And we lost a generation because of it. But you know, here's the good part. Get ready for a loud amen. There's still time. Put your hand over your heart say, there's still time for me to be great, to do something great to do more than I ever imagined. Now, one of the men that I'm describing, you're going to be, uh, see him in a moment. I'm going to have him stand. God has given him an ingenious way to help the homeless. Ingenious. I wish I had time to tell you, but he and I are united. We're working together, taking a tent, from the northern end of 99, starting in Chico, California, all the way to Bakersfield. And I'm going to tell God to convict you all to join us in Bakersfield. Because what is going on is gang members are getting saved. Drug addicts are getting delivered. And, and a movement is starting in the heart of Highway 99. I'll tell you a little more about it later. But I want you to give a honor to a man of God who puts up our tent. His team infiltrates the gangs and the homeless, brings them in. And the stories we have to tell, I wish I had time. We don't, but I'm going to have you honor him. Frank Saldana, Inner City Action, stand up right now. I mean, give him a great big hand right there. Thank you, man. I don't want you to take this wrong. I want you to take it right. How many of you, if I got a little time to open the Word of God today? How many of you are hungry? How many of you have been to a restaurant where they charge high prices but gave small portions? <laughs> My wife and I were getting in the elevator here locally uh, in our hotel and... Uh, there were three young ladies, girls probably in their 20s, and they were laughing and giggling, and they got in the elevator with us, and I kind of started talking to them, and I said some things, and they said, well, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from San Francisco. I live in Reno now, but I'm from San Francisco. And, and she looked at me with the saddest look, like almost pity. She said, what are you doing here? And you know, before you take offense, that can be said by youth in any city in America right now. They're saying that in Reno. I know they're saying it in San Francisco. And one day, and you got to get this because if you don't, nothing else is going to make sense. I thought that I was going to retire. I thought that, you know. 
It was up there with uh, my dream to be a center in the NBA. <laughs> Some of you are laughing a little too good there. But uh, I can't retire. I'm in a war. Amen. You can't, and I won't, never. But the Lord said, I want you to know that I'm going to give you a grace to go back and win youth more than you did even when you were young. And I thought that would be shocking. So one night, I sat up straight in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. What is up with God and three o'clock in the morning? How many of you has God awakened you at three o'clock? You know, I don't know if you've told Jesus this, but I have. I'm really alert at noon. Right? But what I heard next was this. Study the youth culture again. Research it. People that know me know that I'm a reader. I read. I study history. I read biographies. My favorite book is the Bible. That is where the preponderance of my reading is. But in my research on the youth culture, I became devastated devastated by what I saw and understood to be going on, and I'm going to capsulize it for you, that at the end of it, late one night, reading in a hotel, studying, doing research, and having other people help me with research, I felt evil enter my hotel room. And I mean evil. I felt the place darken. I felt a stench. I felt evil, and I could hear this sneering voice boasting of what it was going to do to American young people. Jesus. Boasting of what he had done and would yet do. I will humiliate them. I will confuse their gender. I will addict them to drugs. And I will drain the very will to live out of them I will destroy them. And suddenly the room filled with the glory of God. And a louder voice said, but I will pour out my spirit on them. I need some help right now. I will pour out my spirit on them. And they will prophesy. I don't know if you're going to like the young people God saves in the next few years. Don't know if you're going to be able to like them. But I'm taking you back to the elevator for a moment. The difference between my generation and this generation is summed up in a simple phrase. Nothing to look forward to. Nothing to look forward to. Uh, the millennials are the first generation that will according to science, which is wrong, will have a shorter lifespan than the previous generation. They've been told since the beginning, and I'm going to say what's been said to them, we're not going to pick on millennials today. We're going to pick on the machine that created this horrendous atmosphere that we're watching right now. When you tell a generation, you're never going to get off of drugs, so we're going to give you free needles. Do you understand what that spirit does? If we offer them condoms and needles, we're giving them the unspoken message that they're never going to have self-control. They're never going to be free. They're always going to be the client of the state. The one interesting way to summarize it is that they have switched victory and defeat are interchangeable words. What they think is excitement. For example, 
We believe in our culture that we should celebrate everyone's lifestyle no matter what. And we should affirm them no matter what. So that's to me like saying to someone who's anorexic, you're right, you are fat. You're not helping me enough. At some point, sanity's got to kick in. Give the man an amen. At some point, we got to tell him that is perversion. You may not understand it's perversion. We have doctors that perform operations that are, would horrify the Nazis in the Second World War. They're willing to do procedures on human beings because that human being wants that procedure done. Do you know there is a psychological condition where people want their limbs removed? They want their arms cut off, their legs cut off. And in some instances, surgeons have allowed that. At what point does a doctor look at a young girl and say, listen, just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean God made you that way. At some point, how many of you know some adult supervision needs to walk into the room? Somebody said, amen. Amen. 